Uh, today I'm uh, I'm bringing you a couple of guys uh, from uh, the homeless shelter here in Cleveland. Uh, these uh, these guys uh, are processing their experience uh, exceptionally well. Uh, I work at the shelter. I'm, uh, I'm a caseworker there, uh, and I've been there for a little while. Uh, I'm interested in uh, John and Rick telling their stories. Uh, yeah, I think it's important that uh, their stories uh, come from them. It's important that uh, the larger community understands uh, what their experience has been, what their experience is. It's important for the larger community to have a first-hand account of homelessness. Uh, to have a first-hand account of the connection of homelessness and uh, re-entry, uh, that is, uh, involvement in the criminal justice system. Uh, now, Rick and John uh, don't get too much into it. Uh, they kind of skim the surface of their stories, uh, and that's okay. Uh, this is a process. The storytelling process um, is one that uh, that we uh, Rick, John, and I, all of us who uh, talk about these things will get better at. My name is Rick. I'm 24 years old. I currently stay in a homeless shelter. This all started since 2010 from when I got out of prison, going from house to house to house, living with females that couldn't really do much for me, for real. It was just a place to stay. Um, kick, she kicked me out. Came 21, and I've been living in the shelter since then. Now, I done felt like ever since I've been in this situation, I have grew a lot more. I done learned a lot more, you know, because I'm surrounded by a whole lot of different type of people with different attitudes. So, um, I learned to adjust to these type of people. Um, I learned to cope with people um, older than me because I'm one of the youngest in the shelter, so it's kind of hard to, to, to live in a situation like this for so long. See, I've been in this situation since 2010, so it's been a long time, 2014 right now. So in this situation right here, it's kind of hard to live with a whole bunch of different attitudes, but I have learned to grow into this type of situation, you know, so, in about a few months or so, maybe the situation will get a lot better. Hopefully, I'm praying that it get a lot better. Um, have a lot of friends that help me out, teach me good things, talk good sense to me, great knowledge. So, um, I got a good mind, a good head on my shoulder. Okay, so you mentioned you were in prison. What did you go to prison for? Well, back in 2009, I caught a, a aggravated robbery charge and went to the, um, the courts and... They dropped it down to a regular robbery, which was an F3, and they only gave me a year, gave my co-defendants probation. So why, why were you, what was up with that? Well, I was young, I was 19 years old, and I just felt like everything was coming to an end. My mom was in prison, um, it was just me and my sister in this big house, and my mom owned real estate, and I didn't feel like it was... It just felt like it was too much on my mind. And when I went to jail and I lost my first car that I bought, I just felt like, man, you need to go do something. You need to get some money because the house ain't going to pay for itself. So I just thought of something that was going to make me some quick money. So and that was the first time you got in trouble? That was the first felony I ever caught. No, uh, no juvenile stuff? Oh yeah, juvenile. Yeah, I had a juvenile record, but it, me being so young, my juvenile record now is it was just like I grew up at, at a certain age. So how old were you when you had your first juvenile case? I was 13 years old when I had my first juvenile case. What was that about? Assault. Just a little fight. You know what I'm saying? It was a misdemeanor, but assault. So I've been catching cases since I was about 13. Okay, now. so what happened when you caught that case? Nothing really. It was just a little. It was a tap on the shoulder, wrote an apology letter to the police officer and the person that I got into it with, and it was just, it was over with after that. Okay, did you serve any lockup time or anything? Well, when I was in juvenile, I served about 
six months to a year in YDC, which is in Hudson, Ohio. Okay, and then after that, uh, when was your next uh, uh, difficulty? Well, I didn't get in trouble until, well, I, I used to drive cars without license. That was a little misdemeanor, but then after I, when I turned 19, that's when everything started happening. That first felony happened. Okay, so how much time did you serve on that robbery? Just a year. Yeah, and just And that was year. in prison? Yeah, that was in prison. I was in a Belmont Correctional Okay, so during that year, uh, uh, describe your experience during that year. You were 19? I was 19 years old, and when they told me that I got a year, it, everything that the judge said just went out the air. And, you know, people in the in the pod when I was in the county was um, saying, you know, this and that and the third was going to happen when you got to prison. And as soon as I got to prison, the first time I got to prison, it was like I knew everybody there. Dang, you've been here for a long time and this, that, and this, everybody. But for somebody that has an experience being in prison and they on the road to going, it's not a great experience. It's not a great experience okay, at all. Okay, so uh, let's go back. You said you served how much time on that case? One year. All right, what did you do during that year in prison? How would you spend that year? Well, you know, the only person that I really had on my side is really my grandma. My mom was in prison. Couldn't really what expect. What was your mother in prison for? Um, sexual battery and sexual assault. She was in prison for. And my mom was just going crazy because I felt like the... I don't want to seem like I'm not taking responsibility for my own actions as a man and blame it on anybody else, but I feel like the reason that my mom was so messed up was because what my mom was going through, so everything just took action from there. Okay, but being, you, you mentioned your mom several times, uh, several times, but you haven't mentioned your father. Well, shoot, I really don't know my father. When I first moved to Ohio, my mom was with a guy who I called my stepfather, and that, right now at this time, it's been a few years since I even seen them or heard from him, so. So what was that relationship like between your mom and your stepdad? It was cool, it was a little rocky, you know, because it was some situations that occurred during the time that he was in the family, um, but other than that, it was a cool relationship. Okay, so you go and you do a year, and then you come out, and then what? Well, when I went to do a year, I came out and I met this girl. I had already met her before I went in, but when I came out, I got paroled to her house and um, me being who I was and young, it felt like that the social network society was too much on my mind. I couldn't focus on being with this one person at the time, even though it was to the point where I didn't make it seem like I was doing anything, it just got to her and she wound up kicking me out and now I'm in the situation. Okay, so how long were you there before you uh, were homeless? I wasn't even there for a month yet. It was let, probably about three and a half weeks. Okay, so the relationship failed. Uh, now you don't have anywhere to stay. Uh, where'd you go? I went to 2100 on Lakeside. In Cleveland? In Cleveland. Okay, uh, that was the first time in the shelter? That was my first time. And I actually had a buddy who came with me so I can, you know what I'm saying, so we could do the struggle together because he was going through some problems, I was going through some problems, and we just came together. And okay, so uh, how long did you stay in the shelter uh, your first time at the shelter? Well, my first time at the shelter, um, I stayed in there for about, I'll say probably a month because I had a, I had a, got a job. Before I got kicked out, I had a job interview the next day, so she kicked me out. When I had the interview, I got the job, went to Independence Community, and I met a girl in the same building, and I just messed up. Didn't even come back and lost my bed. Okay, so you left the shelter to move in with another girl. Right. Okay, and what happened then? Well, some things had occurred, you know, me being stubborn or whatnot, things had occurred and I was put out again with nowhere to go. After how long? Maybe about three months this time. Okay, so you got put out by the second girl? Yes. Okay, and then where, where'd you go? I went back to the shelter. You went back to the shelter for the second time? For the second time. Okay, so how long were you in the shelter the second time? Well, this time I was only in the shelter for about maybe three weeks until they transferred me into a transitional housing program 
which I was there for about four months. Then I got locked up again for um, parole violation. What was the violation? Parole violation. What was the violation? Escape. Because you didn't report? Yes. Okay, and so they sent you back down for that? Well, actually, I sat in there for about maybe 14 days, and my parole officer came to see me and uh, lifted the hose, so I was able to be released. Okay, and then where'd you go? I went back to the shelter. For the third time? For the third time. All right, so what happened this time at the shelter? Well, this time I was at the shelter. Um, like I said, I was only there for maybe 14 days, three weeks, and you they sent me. I was in jail for about 14 days, but I came to the shelter and I was in the shelter for about 14 days yeah. and they sent me back to the same transitional housing program. Yeah. Boom. While I was in there, I was probably there for about a good three months. I got locked up again for, for, the, for the same thing, escape. Now this time I went, I was there for six months straight. Okay, so hold it. So you, you made the same mistake twice, uh, not reporting. Yes. What was up with that? Well, at the time I was still thinking like a young man. Well, not even a young man, a young boy. I was thinking like because I felt like I'm me. I don't. I don't, who am I to? Re I don't want to report to nobody. Can't nobody tell me to come report? You know, I was in that mentality that can't nobody tell me to do anything. All right. So you got knocked the second time for escape. Well, this time when I got knocked, which was the second time that I got knocked. And I did six straight months in the county. Um, after that six months, I was released. And ever since then, I've been going to see my parole officer every month. Um, I actually supposed to be getting off real soon next month on the 8th. All right, so when you, when you got out after that six months, where'd you go? Well, when I got out after that six months, I had somewhere to stay. I was talking to a girl before I got locked up. And some things occurred. Um, I had sex with her best friend. She got pregnant, and she, she kicked me out. So now you've been kicked out by the third woman. Yes. And where'd you go? Came back to the shelter. For this is the third or fourth time. This is the fourth time. Okay. Now is that is that joint? Are you still in the fourth time now? Yes, this is still in the fourth time right now as we speak. Okay, so how long have you been in the shelter this time? This time I've been in the shelter since last Halloween, October 31st. So it's it'll be a year uh, in another couple of months? Yes. Okay. But so uh, it sounds like your life has been pretty unstable uh, for the last five years or so. Uh, What's up with that? Where are you in terms of uh, who you are and where you are in your life? Well, I can say that I have matured a lot since the past years. Um, right now, um, I'm really taking the steps to um, move into my own house. Um, a lot of volunteer hours um, just to have work experience doing stuff. Um, okay, creative. Are you, work, are you working? Not at the moment. Why not? To keep, to be honest, right now, I'm really not even looking for a job right now. I'm actually focused on education and housing. Uh, you have a GED? Not at the moment. What's up with that? I'm actually focused on my education right now, for real, for real. But the situation, just my mentality, the way I think, is sometimes things distract me and I'm easy easily distracted all right uh, where do you see yourself in the next three years well in the next three years uh, hopefully 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 I have my GED by the end I'm working at least a good $12 an hour job that way I can support for my family so how far did you go in school the 11th grade the 11th grade and that was how long ago that was about eight years ago. Okay, so what do you feel about this DVD thing? Uh, are you how close to you to it? Are you? Well, as in class-wise, not very far because I'm not even enrolled in the class. But 
as far as taking the test and my mindset, I'm pretty pretty ready to take it. What's what's your goal in life? What where are you really want to go with this thing? Once you get your GED, then what? You know, my goal is I just want to be successful. I don't want to, you know, I don't want nothing too big, no, no nothing too fancy. I just want to be a successful young man to say that I, I'm working and I take care of my family. You have, uh, you mentioned one child. Is that it? You got one child? Well, at this moment, I do have one child, a girl. She's two years old. Um, I'm supposed to have another one on the way real soon, due in January. All right. Uh, so, you have a relationship with your daughter? Nah, I really don't. And it's not because of me, it's because of the mom. You know, and I'm not the type of person just, you know, some baby daddies is, is, is a real presser. So, not me, but. Okay, are you providing any support for your daughter? Not at this moment. And what's that about? Where, where are you with that? Well, it, it all has to do with the mom. You know, I could call the mom right now and be like, can I see my daughter? And she'll be like, you got something for her? It's never just me spend time with my daughter. And I'm a love, I'm, I love kids, you know, and just the relationship that I have with her is just, it's nothing. It's like I don't care attitude every okay, time I so talk to I her. so I asked about your relationship with your daughter and whether or not you support your daughter and you started talking about the mother. Mm-hmm. Well, the mom, she's young, you know. I'm, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in the mother. I'm interested in you and your daughter. Well, my daughter, the mom plays a big important role in my daughter because she's the one that has custody of her. And I can't see her without going through the mom. Okay, so do you have any child support obligations? My, my baby mom says that I do. I never or have yet to seen a letter from child support saying that I owe child support. Didn't even bother to go check. They got addresses that I have been and no one ever told me about child support and that's very important for somebody to hide from me. So I don't know about that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My name is John, 42 years old, resident of Cleveland, Ohio. Currently residing at a men's homeless shelter, going through the process of Reentry, coming from a stint in incarceration. Started on this journey about 20 some years ago, doing drugs and alcohol in the streets, hard drugs. Started out experimenting with drugs and alcohol when I was about 12 years old, smoking cigarettes, drinking beer, hanging out in the streets with friends and associates. You know, uh, wouldn't consider myself a victim of peer pressure in any regard. Just that's what people were doing, that's what I wanted to participate in. So it's been a long road. Uh, been in the streets for a long time. Experienced a lot of things, seen a lot of things, done a lot of things. Some good, some not so good. Had a few stints in the penitentiary, a uh, correctional facility in Ohio, various ones, North Coast Correctional Treatment Facility, Marion, Lorraine. Never been a violent offender or anything like that. Just the overall decent person. Uh, chemical dependency issues, alcohol, substance abuse issues. Trying to maintain my composure, get myself together, do the right thing. Uh, came from a single parent home. My father passed away when I was six years old. No fault of his own, but you know, he's a good man. Several siblings, all older brothers and sisters. I'm the only one of my mother's and father's children who's ever had any serious scrapes with the law or whatever. Only one that's ever been to penitentiary. Basically the only one that's ever had a, a real traffic ticket or definitely a driving under suspension ticket. So I came from a decent home, middle class, colored folks, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, nice neighborhood. Lee and Harvard, Lee and Miles. Got started smoking cigarettes and drinking and whatnot when I was 12 years old. That progressed into marijuana about the time I was 13. The time I was 14 to 15, I was drinking and smoking on a regular basis. Every day, every other day, to be for sure. Uh, going to school high under the influence of marijuana or some type of alcohol. 
Back in the early 80s, it was sun, country wine, coolers, and orange jubilee. If you're from Cleveland or the Midwest, you know what I'm talking about. By that same time, 1985, 1986, uh, the crack cocaine epidemic hit the ghetto, and I was right in the middle of it and got caught up uh, experimenting with different types of drugs, smoking what they call primos or whatever. That's a mix of uh, crack cocaine and marijuana. That was a bad, bad idea, but I tried it. So from about the time I was 16, I smoked crack once, you know, I smoked crack once when I was 16. Problem was I smoked for like seven years. So from the time I was 16 to 23, I was severely addicted to crack cocaine. Uh, I would break into stores. I never broke in anyone's home, but I would break into stores. That was before they shuttered and gated all of the stores in the community. I was the one that would go around at two or three o'clock in the morning and I would time the police circulation to, I could break the door or break the glass out of the window or whatever, get into the store, get all of the cartons of cigarettes, all of the more expensive wine and alcohol and load it up in the shopping carts and smuggle it around the corner before the police arrived while the alarm was on. And I was motivated by crack and my uh, bad thought process that doing crime was a, a resolution or a solution to a lack of funds that I had in order to support my drug habit. By the time I turned 18, I got out of the uh, breaking and stealing thing and I would just go to work and maintain employment had a lady friend, uh, she got to doing crack. She was a little bit older than me and she got to doing crack and I didn't like that. So after she and I stayed together for a couple years, I decided I didn't want to uh, be involved with her or smoke crack anymore. She continued to smoke crack. I quit smoking crack. I decided that smoking embalming fluid, something called wet, I don't know, PCP, LSD, formaldehyde, embalming fluid, horse tranquilizers, skin, sheep, sherm, whatever you want to call it. I thought that would be a, a appropriate alternative and it, it, it was and is more socially acceptable in the ghetto than smoking crack cocaine, but that was my solution for being addicted to crack cocaine. I decided instead to smoke wet and formaldehyde or whatever. PCP embalming fluid, sherm, horse tranquilizer, whatever you want to call it. So I did that for approximately five or six years and to the point where I could feel personally and everyone could notice that like my brain was seriously being damaged or being seriously inhibited by the use of the wet Sherm, PCP, formaldehyde, or whatever. That was messed up. So I did that for about five or six years. Then I uh, gradually reduced my drug addiction to just marijuana. So it was just marijuana as much as I could all day, every day. And I was supporting that habit by selling wet and selling crack. And had a, a lot of uh, good experiences, some bad experiences, but a lot of good experiences selling drugs, made a lot of money, had a lot of fun, if that's what you want to call it. Uh, the devil is evil, that's why they call the devil the evil, D-E-V-I-L. And a lot of things that I've done personally in my life seemed like a good idea at the time. They probably really weren't in hindsight. Hindsight is always 2020. so now I see that maybe some of the choices and decisions I made weren't the best. I wasted a lot of years in the street uh, did time in the penitentiary on several different occasions, six months here, 12 months there. I've never been involved in any uh, serious criminal activity or anything like that. Never got caught up in any uh, drug stings or, you know, uh, task force operations. So, so, so what did you go to prison for? Selling crack. Uh, and... Uh, Every time. How, selling crack. Selling, many, selling, many, one, selling one piece of crack that was wrongfully uh, 
misrepresented as more than one crack transaction with an undercover informant and unequivocally I would always get 11 to 12 months okay, so, so I couldn't how many how many appeal uh, it three times three times, three times yes, sir. Uh, over what period of time over a 10 year period I would say okay and you did about a 12 year? A tw over a 12 year period mm -hmm. from 1992 and 93 to 2004 Okay, so you did about a year each of those three times? Uh, each of those times, and in between, it would be six months here, three months there for uh, driving violations okay. related to the drug trafficking. Okay, so uh, all of your money, uh, for virtually all of your adult life, has come from selling drugs? Yes, sir. Okay, so... Uh, in some form or another, marijuana, wet, pills... Crack. And this I, goes back how many years now? Twenty years. Okay, I started. So I started selling drugs when I was twenty-three years old. Have you ever had a, uh, a legitimate job? No. Through the temp agency, three months here, six months there. I've never been professionally or technically trained to do anything in particular, but I've always been willing to work and do what is necessary to earn a living to support myself. Okay, so. I never really had any idea of a career apart from on the back of a drug deal. Unfortunately, I would have to say that is a true statement. Up until the past 12 months when I was faced with something that I was accused of and charged with, indicted for, but I was not guilty of in any way, shape, form, or fashion, and I was expurgated from that situation after serving 85 days in the county jail, which brought me to a men's homeless shelter in Cleveland, Ohio, where I had an epiphany. I decided that I didn't want to be involved in criminal activity any longer, and I made a personal commitment to change my life as a man going on 43 years old, and I've been on that path attempting to do the right thing. And So why now? It. So why now? What's different with you now than earlier in your life? The criminal justice system in Cuyahoga County was attempting to give me 40 years at the point where the crimes I was being charged with were gonna end up netting me 40 year, a possible 40 year prison sentence, which probably would have only come out to about 10, but at 40 years old, I don't wanna do 10 years in the penitentiary for an association with someone I might not should have been associating with. So I decided that my criminal activity and the lifestyle that I was living is what led to me having an association with someone I shouldn't have otherwise been associating with. So I made a conscious decision not to have those behaviors and activities in my life anymore. So ultimately you did uh, what we call a risk benefit analysis and uh, what makes sense to you is that uh, you need to make a change in your life. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. a risk benefit analysis and the risks far outweigh the rewards and the benefits of selling drugs, smoking marijuana every day, listening to rap music, all of that nonsense. And I've found that uh, listening to R&B and jazz and gospel music and doing the right thing and going to bed on time and getting up on time, early to bed and early to rise, healthy, wealthy and wise, legitimate, honest, legal is a better way for me and I don't have to look over my shoulder when I drive down the street. I don't have to worry when I see uh, law enforcement coming my way. I can walk up to them and shake their hand. I don't have to avoid their gaze or worry about what I have in my pocket or in my shoe or stuffed in my underwear or in my glove box or under the front seat or anything. And it's a better life. It's a better way. All right. So you mentioned being in uh, a homeless shelter. How long have you been there? I've been in the homeless shelter for almost one year now. I arrived at the homeless shelter approximately September the 15th of 2013, and now it's coming up on September the 15th of 2014. In that time, I've met a lot of good people that have offered me a lot of support and assistance in my recovery and my abstention from uh, criminal activity and drugs and alcohol, and I appreciate everyone's help that I've received at the uh, homeless shelter through the 
different services and programs they offer there. All right, so where do you see yourself in three years? Uh, better. In three years, I would like to be a student earning my bachelor's degree, working towards a master's degree in some type of social service or chemical dependency counseling field. I would like to pursue that as a career. I believe with my life experiences and my personality and the character that I possess that I've been blessed by the creator with that I would do good in that career field. Hey, good day to you. My name is John and I'm Rick. We're here today discussing homelessness and re-entry as a result of being homeless, coming home from the penitentiary and incarceration, different uh, experiences you have to deal with. Had the opportunity to come out and share some information with you today. My personal experience is uh, that homelessness is a difficult situation, but if you willing to do the work and put forth the effort to correct the situation, it is doable. It's difficult, but it's a worthwhile endeavor. Uh, I would advise every anyone going through that situation as I myself am to do the best you can. Just you know, try to stay positive, stay focused, handle your business, do the right thing, do what you have to do. Try to uh, stay out the way, not get in any more trouble, get involved in any criminal activity. On a daily basis, I have to deal with all different types of situations in the uh, in the shelter. The shelter is a decent place. It's comfortable. It's not too comfortable. You have to deal with a lot of nonsense from people that are supposed to be in the program or work in the program. They're supposed to be sober. They're supposed to be trying to correct the situation that brought them to the uh, situation of being homelessness that brought them to the shelter, whether it's avoiding criminal activity, avoiding, avoiding violence or violent activity, avoiding uh, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, chemical dependency, marijuana use or whatever. People use marijuana on a regular basis, people use heroin on a regular basis, cocaine, whatever. Uh, you can see all different types of stuff, they, that's why they call it skid rodent. Face, the face of homelessness has changed dramatically. You have entire families, men, women, and children out on the streets now. The economy is not the same. The job situation has changed in America as a whole. Now you have to have some type of uh, technical training or some type of education to further your career to just have a job. They're doing urine analysis and uh, piss tests at McDonald's now. So. All of that, you know, kicking it in the streets and having fun and whatnot is not the same. Uh, I don't know what Rick might have to say about that, but that's my opinion on it. Well, you're looking at it from two perspectives, me being 24 and him being 42. Um, my experience being in the homeless shelter, um, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's, it's bumpy every now and then right. and if you don't have a good mindset then you gonna let it bother you, you know, sometimes you you wake up with attitude sometimes you go to sleep with attitude or sometimes you just got an attitude and I've learned to to sometimes you can't even you can't even talk to certain people because they got certain attitudes or you can't even um, joke around or you know sometimes you want to joke because smiling is good for the heart and you know in this situation sometimes you need to smile because the situation is so so rough um, but as Jonathan was saying there are kids and moms out here on the streets um, sometimes I go outside the shelter and I see ladies young ladies outside selling themselves um, smoking crack or um, just doing stuff that ladies shouldn't even be doing. You know, this not even for for females. This situation shouldn't even be for females. You know what I'm saying? And in this situation, I think that I have learned a lot. I've really learned a lot in this situation, seeing that I'm so young, and it's a it's not that many young people in this situation, and it's not even always the prison part you don't even have to be in prison or just coming out of prison to be in this situation relationship problems you know i don't had a lot of relationship problems and it's nothing like having your own you know what i'm saying 
staying with somebody is so hard, especially when you ain't got a steady income. Food stamps ain't gonna help everybody. Some people already get food stamps, you know what I'm saying? So living with somebody is very hard. You gotta kiss, kiss ass sometimes, or um, you gotta feel like you're the underdog just because it's they stuff. So not even just being in prison, but you know, I, if you haven't been in this situation yet and your mom has told you you either going to end up in jail or you're going to end up dead, the third option will be here. And if you haven't made it here yet, I'm trying to tell you now. Nah, it's not a good experience. So if, if you're not on the right track, please, please get on the right track because this spot right here, it, it only can help you if you want to be helped. If you don't want to be helped, then you just here for no reason. You know what I'm saying? So at that point or um conclusion statement i should make is that um for my young people um if, if you're doing good man and, and you on the right track just stay there because you don't want to fall off and end up like me in the homeless shelter waiting to you know what i'm saying get success from programs and stuff like that when if i was young if i was still younger and i would have listened to my mom Growing up, I probably wouldn't even be in this situation right now, so. Anybody from the age of 18 to 88 can end up at a homeless shelter. The, or from 8 to 88. I see men, women, and children in all different capacities and facets of their life in a situation of homelessness due to, um, due to re-entry or job loss, financial difficulties, uh, family disputes or separations. So I would, I would say that for whatever reason you come into the situation, there are programs and services available to help you. The economy is what it is. The world and the environment and climate in America is what it is. You just have to do the best you can, maintain a positive attitude and always strive to do better and try to make it through you know never give up never quit yeah so through uh, through their accounts this morning uh, uh, I hope that Rick and John uh, have succeeded in uh, at least in introducing you to uh, a deeper appreciation of homelessness, uh, its connection to uh, incarceration and the criminal justice system, uh, and uh, the plight of uh, a significant and growing number of people in our society today.